thanks very much for the presentations. I'm sorry the politicians have to leave. Um, there's something fascinating in this presentation that is at the center of, uh, is it Dr. Newman? Dr. Newman presentation, but it resonated through all three of them. And it is in an interesting way encapsulated in the title of tonight's event, Values-Based Capitalism. And it is a, it's a denuded notion of really what the role of business is in a society. Business is not just to maximize profits. It has to be related in some way to justice which is to render to another person or to the society what, what is its due. That's the classical meaning of justice. Values is the language of Nietzsche. It's the language of the will. It's the language of domination. It's the ubermatch over the others. And values-based capitalism partakes of this kind of triumphalist self, this, this sort of inflated individualism, of, that's the real weakness of, of liber, neoliberalism. But what we need is something else. It's not capitalism, 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 as the politician put it, because that has the problem of lack of definition. What is the purpose of business? It has a moral role in a society. Part of that is to produce goods. We call them goods and services, but they're called good because they're generally good. It also has the responsibility to produce meaningful and just labor. And what happened is with values-based capitalism, the Nietzschean abandonment of a moral framework meets the contemporary business abandonment of a moral framework. And the result is that you have the world of, to use Dickens' this wonderful example from Christmas Carol, you don't have the world of moral business as exemplified by Mr. Fezziwig. You have the world of Scrooge and Marley. And I don't see in this panel, with great respect to three extremely erudite presentations, a sufficiently rigorous moral analysis of the failings of capitalists. Chesterton and Belloc, I think, got it better, got it closer and better when they said that the problem with, with capitalism is monopoly and the state and the problem with socialism is the state by itself. So I think what we're seeing now with Richie Sunak and this whole drive towards centralized digital um, surveillance monstrosity is kind of Western business unrestrained by morality linking with the same framework as Chinese communism in terms of surveillance and the very tremendous, uh, tremendous danger both to human liberty. So I'd like to ask you if you could address the moral failure of the basis of your presentation. You know, I, I'm thinking in preparation for this, well, uh, we, don't, we don't believe in, in letting the market rip. We don't believe in half a strain um, market system. So why, why do we think it's proper to intervene uh, and, and regulate the market lightly, I hope, at, at appropriate moments? I think we do it to make capitalism better and fairer. We do it to stop, to try and stop uh, monopolies forming that then have uh, undue influence on the market. We do it to ensure, importantly, property rights, and contracts, uh, the value of contracts. We do it to ensure that they're trapped in the market. So you go to a bank, you can trust everybody, etc., etc. We, we do so really, I think, uh, or we should be doing so mainly, I think, to force competition because competition it, and I, I've, I've been thinking about this since I read Hayek and I can't think of a, a single example that, that breaks this rule but if you can provide it when there is truly competition in the market it is always and everywhere uh, for the benefit of consumers it always and everywhere is for the benefit of consumers and I can't see it uh, not for that I, don't, I really do think that the, we, we should we should the, the, the corporate focus on its, uh, its uh, obligations to its shareholders who are the ones who have risked their capital. I don't think it's up to others to go and appropriate that capital for other means. That, that worries me. But on the moral dimension, uh, the, we have gotten into a very unfortunate position, I think really since uh, Reagan and Thatcher, where on the conservative side of politics here as in Britain 
come to think it's all about the economy, nothing but the economy. And that's certainly not uh, the, the way Robert Menzies saw it, a man I, I greatly admire. Menzies said that his job as, as Prime Minister was to leave the, co the country both more prosperous and more just. And I think the Conservative side of it needs to rediscover the idea of social, social justice, take that back from the left, reinterpret it the light. And, uh, and it should be there and you should focus on as uh, many did the things you can't measure in power filling and pen. I guess. I'll be very brief. I mean, the only point I would make is that I think that competitive capitalism is the way to uh, be thinking about it. It is when you start getting collusion between government and business, and if you get the free labour come. That's when we get into all sorts of issues about corruption, and we talk about morals, I think that's when we are down, uh, we're in a downward spiral. Um, because the question of values, what values we I think the values we believe in are that people be honest in their dealings, that transparency, all of those sorts of things. There's more principles based than, than black letter law based. What we have come from us, what regulatory environment, a black letter law environment, where it's uh, much easier for the regulators to go in and, uh, and do what they do. But I think it's, it's competition which keeps organisations honest. And the ultimate uh, the ultimate sanction is the customer. The customer believes that the organisation is not honest, or the product goods are not uh, of sufficient quality or whatever, and that they're sold under false pretenses, then the market will shift away from that producer and go somewhere else. But there's no such thing as perfection for this world. We won't get to a utopia, we can do a lot better than we can. I'll make it a short question. Um, my question is for you, Morris. Um, you mentioned that union bosses are by and large super fund managers now, and, they, and as such they have inordinate influence because they control so much money. My first question is why is it the case that they are allowed to get into such a position of um, trammel strength, I guess, and influence? Secondly, surely in this value space, capitalism, politically correct environment, they would, the government of the day would insist on diversity and not allow them to have such a monopoly of position. Well, I think, I think that uh, it was inevitable that when you set up a regime such as compulsory superannuation, you make it uh, likely that interests that uh, have control over large workforces will seek to pool the sources of the people who work within organisations and who are members of the trade union. So what we find is again this unholy alliance between government. Let's remember that Mr Keating when he established compulsory superannuation with Mr Don or Dr Don Russell as the then architect of this scheme. It was inevitable, in a, in a sense it was portrayed as being a private sector means of taking the pressure of the public pension. But essentially it was still controlled by the centre, by government. And that's what we have seen. But as this had progressed, what we've noticed is the transparency uh, particularly amongst the, the industry, is missing. So that we're finding all sorts of money going to trade unions to get more members. Now, that is not my understanding of what compulsory superannuation uh, intended to be. Uh, but the worst thing is, the money is being dispersed by the managers of the industry funds to the individual trade union. 
the trade unions concerned do not have to account for the money which they receive. Now, Mr. Lee, who is the minister responsible, said, well, you know, we don't need to get into that sort of detail of bog all these unions down. Uh, they can just say, well, we will receive $10 million, or whatever it was, and you did what was necessary to get more membership. Now, whether they went around the world a hundred times, who would know? But this is where we're at. And there's something like $30 billion now in, in management fees that are coming from these uh, industry superannuation. And uh, this, is, this is such, uh, such a, uh, a, a monopoly, essentially. It's probably not quite a monopoly because it's only about 30% uh, of, of the total, but it is of such magnitude and it has captured business because of the shareholder activism that goes with it. And so we've got this very, this circular situation where you've got superannuation funds managing all sorts of uh, uh, membership money. The members really have virtually no say over how the money is invested and they don't even know who it is that's actually representing them on the, on the industry funds. Uh, so we have that situation driving policy so these people actually in the boardroom, not physically, but, uh, but uh, figuratively in the boardroom telling the companies what they should do, how they should invest, regardless of whether this is ultimately going to create value. And so this is the situation we're, we're driving to, and this is the point that Nick was making related to energy policy. And it was the point I was making, that we have a position where investments are being made based on ideology, based on an experiment, regardless of whether or not it's going to be the best interest of the, of the members of particular funds. And those people don't know that. They are simply treading the line which is accepted as being we need to, for climate change, we need to cut down on CO2. Uh, whether there's an investment to return at the end of the day, who knows? And that was what I was driving at earlier. I believe that in another 10 or 20 years, there will be class actions against the trustees of these companies, of these uh, funds, because they will be seen to have been ideologically driven and not investing in the best interest of the people who money they were. So they breached their financial interests. My concern is this, that nothing in Australian governments, what it seems to be, what, now I, that may sound a little bit right, or a like what it used to be, but governments sell off resources where they used to supply resources. They sell them. Are we moving more towards the American style of sort of, um, you know, the company owns all the resources more than the I don't, I don't see we're moving the American one, we're moving the whole new direction. Uh, it's been accelerated really the last five to ten years. But it, it is it is it is the idea that a uh, the a small you know, a, a relatively small interest group uh, can decide big matters of, of state and that, that's happening seems to be more frequently nowadays. You have governments like the current government, like the Ardern government, like the Andrew government, that become captured by by an idea, by a campaign, and I think they're driving energy being a good example, they're driving the policy in a direction that completely unhelpful for the rest of the people or people paying high energy prices at the moment. Uh, those energy prices hit the poorest most. Uh, in Tasmania, for instance, the average electricity bill is twice as high as anywhere else in the country and yet they have the the lowest average wage. So but that's that being driven 
by uh, people who have uh, either an ideological fixation on climate change, increasingly people that have large investments in renewable energy that are now very powerful people. So I, I see that with the, the interests of the broader population of the nation are not being are not being helped by the rise of these, these very powerful groups. I mean, I'll give you an example, for instance, you know, the, the, the Teal movement, how many MPs have they got? I know Sophie would know the eight, but uh, where did their funding come from? Almost entirely from people heavily invested in the renewable sector uh, and their driving policy to support that. So I think this is a very you know, whatever you think about renewable energy, for one sector of the economy, by AMPs, <coughs> heavily the current government, and the last one for that matter, I think this is very, very dangerous, undemocratic territory we're in, and it's not like anything you've seen before. Um, I view. <coughs> I'd just like to add that uh, compared to when I was growing up anyway, a long, long, long time ago, that uh, my sense is that we had fewer career politicians. When I look at where politicians come from today, it's invariably through some, uh, some ministerial or some politician's office or through the trade union movement, they haven't had any real world experience. And I think uh, all they're interested in is Winning election, if it means getting into bed with somebody uh, like the two as, as uh, Nick was saying, then that's what they will do. We have so we have an inversion. Instead of those people representing us, they see us and the, the sort of master servant relationship. We're now the servants, and they're the masters. And I think this is where it is so dangerous because where it is heading, as I was saying about Sebastian, if looking at these things from the the box in the theatre, uh, we as, as uh, public are not doing enough to say this is not acceptable. Yes, Jim, I can see you were burning oh, up. Oh, I'll keep it short. We see the values being surrounded, not necessarily being the values of the people, the majority of the people. Uh, just what happened with Budweiser, just losing customers because they're being plugged in the LGBTQIZNP. Do you feel that there might be a niche for a politically incorrect, say, superannuation fund that uh, directs its uh, business not into promoting weird things, uh, but into producing real stuff that of course real people want to buy and of course real people also have their, their own personal ethics. Do um, you believe that would be profitable? It's already happening. A number of the state pension funds in the United States are withdrawing their money from BlackRock or their, their members' money from BlackRock because they believe this is the, the, the BlackRock, who is an ESG investor, are not doing the best thing by their, their members. And so they have pulled out billions and billions of dollars. It doesn't make much of a dent in BlackRock, so they manage billion. But nevertheless, it is a start. And I think this is, this is where it becomes a bit tricky because if more and more of these funds decide, because the more money that is withdrawn, the less upward pressure on stock prices there will be because if we let money get the prices up. And so these, these, uh, uh, these portfolio investors tend to have, a, a, they have to keep it in a certain weight to manage the risks. And that was the point I was making before. When, when if, if the market starts to go down and they find they're overweight in certain companies, they're going to have to sell them. So it is already happening. We're already seeing that uh, people are rebelling. And uh, so they should. But in Australia it's probably a bit different because the industry funds in particular are so enormous. As I say, they control 30% of 3.1 trillion. That's quite a lot of money. And they are 
part of this cartel of big government, big labour, and, and uh, big, big uh, corporations. So we have a lot of work to do. I think if, if there was such a front, I'd put my money in it. I mean, Dr. Frank, you can't rely on it, you saw this morning in Australia that one of the uh, ESG funds is falling very badly if you put your money in, in uh, coal or gas or any of these things in the last five years you can see a very handsome uh, return. Um, the, 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 and it's increased by the fact that the coal companies for instance, uh, are returning a lot of equity to shareholders right now simply or sitting on a lot of capital simply because they can't invest in they'd love to invest in more coal facilities that lead to cheap coal maybe help out Poland or play to Europe with they can't do it. So, um, I do think that um, this is the correct way to invest. Look, I'll just make one final point on that, very quickly. I find it absolutely appalling that banks won't lend to coal miners. Uh, because of the social fallout that uh, they, and particularly I suppose directors of men can't go to cocktail parties so they'd be excoriated, how can you possibly have any money to uh, XYZ coal company? But there's, there is retribution coming because I can tell you the Japanese who rely on Australia 70% for coal, 60% of gas, are now seeing this country as a potential uh, security for their national security is seeing this, seeing us as a sovereign risk. Now that is almost unthinkable, would have been unthinkable, but if this takes hold, uh, first of all, the likelihood is the Japanese will start diversifying their suppliers. Uh, this has got really great consequences for Australia, and it's all because for domestic purposes, we said we've got to reserve this and keep the price down, and therefore Japanese go jump, because we've got political and domestic political con uh, consequences we have to deal with. Uh, you can't have it all ways. And uh, whether you believe in markets or you don't, ultimately markets will have their way. And if you resist them, it's like King can you. If you keep trying to put back the tide, they'll wash over you. And that's what uh, Mr. Xi Jinping is finding in China. He's been pushing down on his market. He doesn't. I've met him, as I was saying to somebody earlier, I've met him three times. He doesn't believe in market, doesn't believe in the reforms that Deng Xiaoping brought into China, produced the sorts of growth that they had over the 30, 40 years. So he's going he's gone all the way back on that, and he's got real issues to deal with because he can't... People say, oh, we've got to please Beijing. Uh, that's not entrepreneurship. If you have to say, well, uh, Beijing be, be happy with what we're doing because what we're doing is to... Do away with this. Anyway. That's painful. Um, I like happy endings, but where is this going to go? <laughs> because it seems that um, big business is going to keep growing bigger, big unions are going to keep getting bigger, industry funds are going to keep getting bigger. So, is this all going to end bad? Or is, is there some light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. Can you give us some hope? <laughs> invest in candles and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, definitely a Well, uh, as a Christian, I believe in an afterlife, so there you have it. So, uh, I can't see, oh, I, 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 suppose every, I, look, I, I can't see too many uh, limits of hope right now, because both COVID killed all hope, really, not COVID itself, but the excessive um, authoritarian way in which it's managed, and, and the fact that there was absolutely no popular vote against that surprised me. We were polling right the way through COVID and we kept thinking, you know, they're going to say the lockdown is too excessive or um, Dan, Dan Andrews has gone out too hard against protesters or whatever. But every poll came back about 20, 80 in, in favour of the measures. So I do feel pretty gloomy about the chance of correcting. I suppose the hope does lie in in, um, in, the, in, in the rawness of capitalism and, you know, we get great pleasure seeing uh, 
Guy Light's demise in the state, billions of dollars worth of the air price done. Uh, I've always been a bit, I've always thought all ideas have been sus myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had what to have to target. And this, what's been interesting about this is it's been spontaneous. There has been no real right campaign. In fact, several, you know, senior conservative or Republicans over there are showing people not to boycott it because we don't believe in treating markets, you know, weaponizing markets. So those are positive signs and the fact that, uh, you know, in the end we do have an elected every three years and uh, I think, you know, some of the excessive and say the energy policy will, will inevitably have to be smoothed out, we'll have to come to a position where we have a more sensible way of getting net zero got on. Can I say uh, what gives me hope and finish on a happy note is all of you. The fact you have come out and you are here and you're prepared to listen to these points of view. Um, can I say I chair ADHTV. Uh, we're out rating Sky now and uh, which I find uh, we've been going well. Nick's on the board. That's a little over a year. Uh, which tells me there's a huge unmet demand out there. If we look at, we dissect our audiences, they're the 25 to 40 year olds and the over 60s. So below the 25s, we've got some work to do. And between 40 and 60, we have work to do. But I think what we also need is for people to stand up. And when they know something is patently ridiculous, call it out. What we tend to do is to let all this stuff sort of go when we know that it's wrong. So when we have a, a for example, coronation broadcast of the ABC recently, and we had a panel of, of uh, whoever, or an expert, whatever, who were saying how terrible the monarchy has been over the centuries and what, what it's done to Aboriginal people and so on. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people, I mean literally thousands and thousands of people, I think about nearly 2,000 people wrote directly to the ABC, only 2,000 more people wrote, I know, positive from, to the Australian, who knows how many were on social media, who knows how many people actually thought it didn't go to, uh, didn't put it on, on paper or, or send it electronically. Well, that's probably what they did do. Yeah. But the point I'm making is that here we have thousands and thousands of people who are angered as a consequence of that broadcast. But who is the victim? Stan Grant. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. And nobody actually seems to be making any part about that. So I think that's, that's really what we have to do. And that's, as I say, you people give me encouragement that there are people out there who really do care, who have sensible ideas. Uh, you're, not, you're not extreme, you just understand where things are at and that we're all being full. Hi. I want to talk about banks. Uh, we're running a cartel of four big banks and there's no real competition in the banking sector. It started back in the 80s when banks were deregulated. As a result, all the state banks went out of business. And they left four big banks who are not actually competing with each other. Uh, JP Morgan and HSBC own and control at least 30% in four big banks, and they probably appoint the board of directors as well. Now, that means that there's no competition in the banking sector. Do you think banks should be deregulated so it brings back some real competition? To yeah. both of you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is Morris there. Well, Mike, I, I, um, uh, well, I think John, John Ruddick made, made the point of this uh, to go to all the blending that the, the result of uh, the over regulation of banks and relating to the banking being a tax Petition between banks make part of land. So I don't think the answer is more regulation. Probably uh, deregulation in some important regard, particularly in regard to lending, has been a disaster. Uh, 
then you know, Malcolm Turnbull can do the back. Yeah, I mean, Royal Commission's always bad things to call anyway, I think, because uh, you know that the recommendation will be more regulation, no matter what it is, whether you do well on, on aid care or backing, it's going to be more regulation. So if you think more regulation is a good idea, not only that, of course, it's a bit like hat flips, you know, uh, uh, if you send out and look for weapon mass destruction, of course, you can't come back to that, found any. Uh, so we did find dummy by the way there. I think this is what Royal Commissions tend to do. They feel they have to come back with a, a long list of recommendations and, and they might all be new recommendations. Uh, so I, I just think those are the bad things. I don't like the banks, but uh, I think we let, uh, let them differentiate a bit more. How can you warming up? I, I think that uh, clearly what we have is an incestuous situation. The people within the banks, so we've got a cartel of four banks, essentially, and the people who work for NAB go to the ANZ, we go, go back to West Bank, and, and so we have, we have a situation where we have this incestuous uh, situation. We've had a Royal Commission which essentially took away the risk-taking of the banks, that they're not allowed to lend this person to that person, John Rattler the same, notwithstanding the fact that uh, they have the capacity to lend, notwithstanding the fact that may, may be a, a, a good credit. But what we're finding is that the know your client rule means that uh, they don't want to foreclose on your house because that would look Terrible. So they don't lend to you, or if they do lend to you, the deposit you've got down is so high that it, it, it rules a lot of people out of out of contention. Uh, so what we need is more competition. There's no question the major banks, the top five banks, believe now they are too big to fail. And that's a terrible situation because it really removes the whole threat. Yes, there's at the margin of competition between the banks, but there's no real competition. And as I was saying, you, know, you won't find a bank that will lend any money to, uh, to a coal company. Uh, I think this is just fundamentally wrong, damaging to our economy. Uh, but, uh, and I think you'll find the Reserve Bank agrees with this as well, that our banks now are risk averse. They won't lend. And that has a real issue going forward in terms of growth of the economy and so on. So, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, we need deregulation. And I think the other thing that came out of the Royal Commission, which really made me cross, was that the regulator came out of it very bad. They talked about the they talked about the culture within the banks. Nobody talked about the culture within the regulators themselves. I mean, it really is a question of get, getting their house in order before they start on pontificating about how the bank should be their operation. But what we have now is APA telling you banks, how much they can pay people, who they can employ. I mean, it, it's uh, an extraordinary situation post, post hand. Anyway, that's another. I look at the uh, value-based capitalism, I sort of think, is this Nirvana, a, a, a left of Nirvana, trying to follow the Edward Rain in reverse sort of situation where we're going backwards instead of forwards. And, uh, I, I, I look at, for the last 20 years, I've been saying we started with the war on terror, with the war on this, with that war on that. We have to be safe from ourselves, and governments use that, but continually, continually to restrict Oh, you know, the activities of people, I thought, I think, well, I'm going to baby that generate. We questioned everything. We came out of the black days of the 50s, 60s, when we were down to uh, depression kids. They'd been through a war, they had black and white news. I understand it. We could understand it. But we questioned it. And, and the world opened up. We bring up our own children so that they never have to experience the restrictions in life that we experience in the, you know, from our parents' days, you know, in terms of service and struggling, health issues in my particular family, uh, financial issues when I was in my teens. You, your values are, are, are actually uh, created by law childhood, and we bring up our children now, they don't have to ever experience this. So they come through and they've been groomed for the last 20 or more years from 
kindergarten age or 30 years from kindergarten age, you think you live in this marvelous world and we have a safe world. But, but the interesting thing is you get to the point now where those children are now got more kids. They've got kids of their own and they say to them, well, do you want some teacher talking to your child when they're five or six about what their six brother is or where they might and they look at you? And I say, uh, you know, like, uh, isn't it great that we've had uh, all this money spent on renewables and they're paying substantially more for uh, electricity than we should be? Uh, you look at the Greens in uh, Germany and their vote is just collapsing because of the uh, energy crisis over there. And I think ridicule is probably the way to do it. Uh, you know, you, sh you, you don't argue that it's wrong. You just say, well, yes, I'm, I'm male, I'm middle-aged, I'm white, I'm obviously privileged, and I don't want to know what I'm talking about, but I take great, and I'll say this to my kids' friends, and I look at them and sort of go, Papa, and, and then I'll say that, I know as a person that you have a child and can just be, and you can't tell me otherwise, you can, I think it's correct, it's correct. And they suddenly get the car check, and it's like the emperor with no clothes, sooner or later, they're all going to wake up to what's happening, and a good recession, and unfortunately the world's bubble is going to pop. We're in for a recession, I think. That's going to be the thing that makes people focus as people's opinions and views on what they really want and what's important. Your thoughts on that? Yes, the yeah. Well, I think that might illustrate the, uh, exactly the problems with the idea of value-based capitalism. Whose values? Yes. You know, uh, whose values? And, and if it's the values of those people, exactly. And if it's the values, of, the values that are behind the nonsense that you've talked about, then. Sorry, we don't buy that, you know. And, and one, one um, without which you get too deep, I mean, I think we've got a big challenge here, as in the States, in that we, we, we don't share values to the community in the way we once did. Uh, and personally, I think the decline of religion has had some, a lot to do with that. But, you know, we, we no longer have this clear set of national values, and even those values we do have, we're not prepared to articulate in the way that one did. Uh, and in the end, that's, that's what is it, vital for holding us together as citizens and as a nation. But come their values and uh, versus ours, and um, that's the problem with values. But it would be exactly the same, by the way, if, if you know, in a, in a, in a different life, Bob, Bob Catter and Barley George became Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, started to impose their values. It's not, um, not that, that, it's not that, it's particularly the people who happen to be in charge, it's just that they need to be governing for the whole country and, and they're not when they do those policies. Uh, sorry, in the youth, another condition that it's like because if citizen doesn't want property, they are sick. And these days, young generation has come to buy property as well issue. Another issue is more and more property is rise building, it's making it too strong. And uh, strata management law is horrible, and it's and cut is dealing with that. It's not a real court, it's a catastrophe. And uh, with very, with no absolute investment, strata management for companies that control ridiculous amount of it. And human being has thrown to reorganize themselves from uh, control how can we get managed building. How are we gonna solve the problem? Because it's huge money and more and more less and less people that have uh, ownership. And that uh strong management company will bankrupt people and I'm not an expert on uh, external energy, really, but I'm going to say I don't know a lot about uh, strata management. I do agree, though, that property ownership is very important. Uh, property ownership, ownership of uh, of active, uh, of, of uh, equity in, in the design. 
very important. Uh, because that gives people a stake in what we can talk about. Right? And so what we've been finding is that uh, it's becoming harder and harder for people to own property. Because the price is going beyond their capacity to be paid. We've got the banks, as we were saying, making it harder for you to borrow. And we've got a pressure to be your, uh, your, <coughs> next, your next session on immigration, pushing price beyond the ability of people who are on average income to be able to enter the uh, they become that forced to be rented. And very often the people who own the property are absolutely yeah. bad. Yeah. values that we've got now. 